Well, I grew up in an alcoholic family. My mom um, was a pretty heavy drinker when I was uh, in my young and impressionable years. About 13 years old, I got involved in uh, drinking, uh, which was a way for me to kind of numb my pain and my feelings. And I would say probably that was the first, looking back, that would be the first um, false idol that I was using, and it was just a way of medicating. I just was, was very uncomfortable with my skin. I was an introvert, uh, very low self-esteem, and that was something that I used for several years. Well, I continued uh, kind of as a uh, maintenance alcoholic, and uh, when my uh, wife, Kristen, got pregnant with our first son, Ryan, I uh, kept promising uh, her that I would stop drinking. When he was born, um, I had a situation come up where we had to have a pretty serious heart-to-heart -heart talk, and uh, she just basically shared with me that it, either I uh, change and uh, stop drinking and, and do something about it, or that I might have to find another place to live. And, and I definitely did not want my children to grow up in an alcoholic family like I did. I had been uh, in the wilderness, I'd been stirring, that there was just something going on inside of me that I knew there was more than I was getting from having a belief in a higher power. And at that particular moment, I just had this incredible rush, uh, uh, just uh, the chills going up and down my spine and my back and my arms. That's when I completely opened myself up to the Holy Spirit. And that's when I fully accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And uh, that was something that, that was a huge change for me and really, really uh, got me looking at life in a whole different way. I know that Jesus is there. I know that no matter what happens, I can deal with it. I know that He is, has got a plan for me. And when I, when I trust His plan and when I get out of the way and stay out of the way, uh, things always seem to work out for the better. When God is the first in our lives, when God is above all else, life is in the right perspective. When something else takes that place and comes above God, that thing, that person, whatever it is, becomes an idol. It takes the God-like place, and God doesn't just stay in second place. When something else comes above God, God just seems to fall down the list of our priorities really, really quickly. And we're talking today about what it means to... to Keep God first in our lives to worship with passion to avoid those things that are idols. Uh, some years ago, a, a couple of very bright people got together and they decided they didn't like the Ten Commandments in the Bible. They didn't like God telling them what to do and telling people what to do. So they decided they were going to come up with their own Ten Non-Commandments. And one of these two people was the head of a large tech company that you would recognize if I said their name. And the other was a chaplain at a university that you would recognize if I said the name of the university. And he was an atheistic chaplain. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? An atheistic chaplain. So an atheistic cha chaplain and a tech leader got together and they did a kind of a worldwide survey. Said anything else. You send in what you think are better commandments or non-commandments than the Ten Commandments. They offered $10,000 to each person that came up with one that fell on their list. They pulled together a whole group of people to then vote, and they came up with their 10 non-commandments. These are actually in detail in one of the books that I used to research for this uh, series, Kevin DeYoung's book. We were selling it in the bookstore over there. But, uh, but they came up with 10. I'll give you a few of them, all right? Here's a couple of their, their this is worth $10,000, this non-commandment. You ready for this one? Every person has the right to control their body. That's you know, that, that's, that's, one, they said, that's one of our non-commandments. Well, it sounds more like a commandment than a non-commandment, but here's the next one. This one's very interesting. Treat others as you would want them to treat you and can reasonably expect them to want to be treated. Think about their perspective. You ever heard the term plagiarism? <laughs> that's plagiarism. You know where they stole that one from? Jesus. All right? Listen to this. This is what, Ma this is what Matthew 7, 12 says. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Does that sound familiar at all? For this sums up the law and the prophets. They ripped off Jesus and made 10,000 bucks for it. Uh, there's no one right way to live. It's one of their 10 non-commandments. Here's one, another one. Leave the world a better place than you found it. Not a bad idea, but it's a commandment, not a non-commandment. Leave the world a better place than you found it. I mean, so their Ten Non-Commandments are kind of interesting, but they, they came up with these because they really didn't like the Ten Commandments, and they want to come up with their own version. So here's a question. Why spend 10 weeks studying the real Ten Commandments? Why would Shoreline Church 
spend 10 weeks in the summer, when it's so beautiful outside, talking about the Ten Commandments. Well, here's some reasons. First, we don't know them as well as we should. If you're a Christian, if you go to church, you should know the Ten Commandments. That means reading them, getting, you don't have to memorize word for word all the passages, but know, be able to list those Ten Commandments because God gives them to set you free. And if you want to walk in freedom, know God's will for your life. How about this? We don't really know what they mean. We might know what they are, but do we know what they mean? And that's what we're digging into every week this summer, is what does it really mean? What do these commandments mean, and how do they set us free? They're a simple tool that shows us the heart of God. When you understand the commands, you hear the heart of God. God loves life. God wants people to feel safe, not like someone's going to steal things all the time. You see the heart of God come through the commandments. They carry much of the message of the Bible. If you take the Ten Commandments and what they teach and look through the Bible, you see these themes come up again and again and again, and they are central in Jesus' teaching. Jesus taught on the Ten Commandments, and he expounded on them, and many of the themes he spoke about tied into the truths of the Ten Commandments. The law shows us our sin and the need of grace. One of the things about the Ten Commandments is it shows us that we are not living the way we should and the greatness of God's grace. When we see the commands and understand what Jesus taught about them, we realize, I've broken those. I need the grace of God. And we need to understand the greatness of God's grace. And then following them, following the Ten Commandments can change a life, a home, a culture, and the world. If you were to sit down this afternoon and take 10 minutes and read through the Ten Commandments and just imagine that everyone in your home or everyone in our community followed them all the time. And imagine what your home or community would look like. It would blow your mind. The freedom, the safety, the health, the goodness that would flood in if people actually follow these. God is longing to set us free, to change us, to transform us. Also, the Ten Commandments give us a window into God's nature. These commands show us the nature of the God that we gather to worship today. The first commandment, the first of the Ten Commandments, which we looked at last week, the first commandment says, don't worship the wrong God, small g. It says, no other gods before me. Just don't worship the wrong God. The second commandment says, don't worship the wrong way. Don't worship idols. Don't set up idols, these statues that you bow down and worship, or an idol's anything that takes its place. God is first. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all of my life, God is first. Anything that takes his place above God, it becomes idolatrous. It can become an idol in our lives. And God says, don't worship the wrong way. The Ten Commandments are clear, brief, and powerful. When you read them, I mean, they, they have a punch to them. One of the Ten Commandments we're going to look at later in the series is just two words in the Hebrew. It says, know this. It says, don't do this. That's the whole thing. They're, they're, they're clear. They make the point. And the one we're going to read today, the Second Commandment, is a little bit longer but when you get into it, you're, some people read the second commandment and they're like, they're like, oh, that makes me uncomfortable. I don't like what it's saying. But they don't really understand what it's saying. And we're going to dig in and try to understand what this is saying today. So follow along with me. Exodus chapter 20. If you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus 20. If you have your tablets, you can open up to Exodus 20, chapter, uh, chapter 20, beginning of verse 4. It'll be on the screen as well. Here's the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an image or an idol in the form of anything in the heaven above or the earth beneath, or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. There's the key. False allegiance, false worship, putting it first. And then this is the part that bothers people, and we're gonna unpack this a little bit. This part, this part bothers a lot of people. It says, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Lord God, we come together today and we pray that you would unfold these words for us, that we would understand the freedom that comes by worshiping you first and putting you first, and we would recognize the bondage that comes when we put anything else above you, even ourselves, even our own dreams or wants. Lord, speak your truth to us through your word this day. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in the time that this was written, God's people were leaving Egypt and moving into Canaan. And what you see on the screens there are are an idol that was found that was dug up and a picture of of, idol worship, which was pagan and horrible and violent and vile. But but in, in the ancient world, the people of Israel were leaving Egypt, which had all kinds of, was polytheist, all kinds of gods and idols, and they were going into Cana, which had all kinds of gods and idols. 
So the culture that they came from and the culture they were moving into was filled with idols and idol worship. Now here's a question for you. Does the culture we live in impact our perspective, our point of view, anything about us? Does our culture impact us? What do you think? I mean, more than we recognize. What we wear, how we talk, how we think, what we consume, it controls so much of us if we're not careful and aware of it. And God's saying to his people, you, you, are, you are coming from and moving into an area filled with idols. Don't get sucked into what's normative. But you stand apart as those who worship the one true God. Now, idols in the ancient world and today uh, are, are something that God says, cast them down. Get rid of them. I want, you, you should have nothing to do with them. In the ancient world, they looked like this, and we can take that picture down now, but in the ancient world, they looked, they looked like physical things that were made you know, of stone, things made of wood, uh, things made of, of metal that people would bow down and worship. And some people today would say, well, I don't do that. I don't, like, I don't have a shelf in my house where I bow down and worship idols, although there's many places in the world where people still do, and they should physically cast down those idols. But whether it's a physical idol or something that takes supremacy in our lives, it's still an idol and it should be dealt with. So here's some of the things that idols do. When you think about your life, what are the things that do this? An idol demands our allegiance. Demands that we're, we're our allegiance to it. An idol gets our worship, gets our heart, and gets our love. An idol takes our focus and consumes our time. Something that takes all of our focus and all of our time can become idolatrous in our lives. An idol becomes the center of our life and the center of our community life. Idols take over. And if we keep God first and seek first him and his kingdom, Jesus says everything else will come into place. I'll add all these other things to you. But if something else takes over, whatever it is, whether it's worshiping a stone image or whether it's, it's some pursuit that we love that becomes more important than God in our lives, our time, our schedule, our heart, and God said, well, God, that becomes first. We don't want to say that, but God, that becomes first. God becomes second. Very quickly, God becomes third, fourth, fifth, 80th, 100th. God just drops down the list. God is oftentimes first, or he just is not really engaged in our lives. And so I want to think for a minute, I want to ask you to do something, to humbly and quietly listen to some things that can become idolatrous in our lives. They can take our place of allegiance and, and consume our lives and take our time and our attention and, and ask God. I had somebody come up and give me an extra one I didn't have on my list. I added it to my list. They said, boy, this is what came to my mind and they shared it with me after the service. I added it to the list. But there'll be something that maybe isn't on the list, but is, is there something right now that honestly your time, your attention, your focus, your energy, it's become more important than God. It's become your God or your, your focal point of your life. It's become idolatrous. Here's some of the things that it could be. And just quietly, and I tell you this, when I... Ask God, is there anything in my life that's either taking over or that's bumping up against my attention on you? There's always something. So let God speak to you. Just quietly right now, listen, and let God kind of nudge you if this is you. Maybe for some people, their idol is a person. A person they know, they're around, that just means everything to them, or a person that they kind of idolize. For some people, it might be a sports team that they just are consumed by that sports team or that figure. For some people, it's a hobby, something they started doing for fun, but now it just takes all their time and energy and resources. It's all they're about. For some people, it could be playing a game or playing a sport, not cheering a team on, but just something, a sport that becomes your life, your identity. For some people, it's their job, their vocation. It's a gift from God, but it's turned into an idol because it's become more important than God. For some people, it's money or stuff the accumulation of things, and that's become the central pursuit of their life. For some people, it's entertainment, Netflix, TV, Hulu. It's hours and hours every night. It's what they look forward to. It's, their, it's, it's the thing their heart longs for. For some people, it's social media, where they have to check their likes and check how they're doing and how the world sees them, and, and really their social media and themselves, they have become their idol. For some people, it's politics, and they're thinking about an engagement has become so much that it, it's, it's consumed their whole life, and all they think about, it's all, they, it's all that drives them. For some people, it's pornography, and the love of images and the pursuit of images consumes their time and their hours and, and, be, and just guides their life. For some people, it's substances, it's addictions, it's drugs or alcohol, and all of a sudden, it matters more than family, it matters more than Jesus, it matters more than everything. 
For some people, it's food. Buying of food, looking at food, eating food, making food. It just consumes their lives. Some of these things are neutral. Some of them aren't bad. Some of them are good things. But even when a good thing, some of them are bad things, but some of them are, are, are just neutral or good. But even if a good thing takes over above God, it's no longer a good thing in our lives. It's become an idol. And God says, you shall have no idols. It's about worshiping God and turning our heart toward him. Because idols were very common, and the people of Israel had been saturated in an idol-filled culture, God had to say, don't let that be part of your lives. And, and all the things I read, they, these are things that can take over our lives. You, 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 you might be tempted to worship a physical thing, but it's usually something different than that, but if it becomes the thing that takes over God's place, we have to deal with it. We have to bring it before the Lord and surrender it to him. Why forbid the making of or bowing down to idols? Why is God, why does God care so much about this? Why is the second of the Ten Commandments no idols? And the bottom line is because God knows that when he's first in our lives, he sets us free. And when he's not, we're in bondage. God knows when he's first in our lives, our lives make sense and everything else comes together. And if it's the other way around, our lives don't make sense. God made us and he knows us. And there's a reason he has said no idols, nothing that takes God's place in our lives. But here's some of the reasons that God forbids making idols, bowing down to them, whether it's a physical idol or these other things that can, be, that can demand our attention. An idol can never represent the glory of a God who is spirit. If you put something besides God first, it cannot represent what God does. It cannot satisfy. Next, images lead to misrepresentations of God. In the ancient world, when they would make physical idols, it misrepresented God because God is infinite and eternal, and this, this is just an idol, something made of stone or metal. A human form would present human limitations. Many of their idols, you saw one on the screen, were little people. That's my God. The problem is you, you present God as a little idol. It doesn't reflect the greatness and the glory of who he is. Why forbid the making of or bowing down to idols? Because we are made in God's image and he's not made in ours. We're made in the image of God and we, when we create an idol, we want to make God in our image instead of us in the image of God. Why forbid this? Because he is creator and why represent him as part of the creation? God is above creation, beyond creation, the author of creation, not part of it. And we worship things made by God, and those become our God. It's a problem. Why no idols? Because idols give us control over God. They localize God. They make God smaller. And anything in the place of God that's not God is way sm infinitely smaller than the God we should worship. Why? Because God is free and the author of freedom. God is free and calls us to freedom and idols bind us up and put us in bondage. Why no idols? Because we meet God through revelation, his written word and, and the, the, the living word of Jesus Christ. We meet God through encountering him as the God of spirit, the God who reveals himself in his word. Not, and we let something else become God, God gets pushed to the side. There's a passage in the Bible that is not often read, not often preached on, but profoundly powerful when it comes to this topic. And I, I think it captures the heartbeat of what God is saying. I think what God is saying when he says no idols is he's saying, don't you understand who I am? Don't you realize who I am? I'm the one who made you. I love you. You belong to me. I watch over you. And, and, and you're turning these physical things, and you're making these things and calling them God, but I'm the one who made you and you're trying to make me. And so listen to these words. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 46. And in Isaiah 46, if you have your own Bible or your own tablet and you want to highlight a couple of these words, it, it, it'll stand out in your Bible. As I begin to read, I want you to, to highlight or circle in your own Bibles, uh, what are the words that talk about what God does, how he's the one who watches over us when he's in his proper place. So here's what we read in Isaiah 46, beginning in verse 3. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel. Listen to this. You who I have upheld. If you have your own Bible, circle or underline or highlight, upheld. You whom I have upheld since your birth, because I've held you, and carried you since you were born. Carried you. God's the one who carries us. He's the one who lifts us up. So from your childhood, and then even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he, I am he who, circle this, sustains you. God said, I sustain you. I made you, and I will carry you. I will sustain you. I will rescue you. God says, don't you understand? 
I made you. I sustained you. When you were a child and you couldn't walk, God says, I held you up in my arms. And when you're old and you can't walk then, God says, I'll carry you. That's how I love you. That's what you mean to me. When God says no idols, he's saying, let me be God because I'm the one who can carry you through whatever you go through. And then there's like this transition in the passage in verse five where it says, with whom will you compare me or count me equal? What are you gonna put above God? What are you gonna compare to God? With whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me what, that, that we may be compared? Is there anyone to compare? And then God says, but this is what you do with idols when you put something above God. He says, some pour out gold from their bags they weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it into a god. They hire a person to fashion and make this idol into a small g god. And then they bow down to it and worship it. And listen to this. Listen to verse 7. They lift it up on their shoulders and they carry it. They're now carrying their god. The god who said, I make you and I love you and I'll carry you from the moment you're born and I'll carry you to the moment you die. He says, now you're trying to make me and carry me around. And now the idols are weighing you down. They lift it to their shoulders. They carry it. They set it in this place. And there it stands. From that spot it cannot move. Even though someone cries out to it. It cannot answer. It cannot save them from their troubles. Do you hear the heart of God? He says I'm the one who made you. I love you. I watch over you. And I will hold you and I will guide you. But you take something and put it above me and say, that will satisfy me. That will carry me. That will take care of me. That will protect me. And he says, it's empty. Whatever it is, it doesn't satisfy. No idol will ever satisfy. It will put us in bondage. And God says, don't you get the picture? I'm here to pick you up and to help you and to carry you. And when you make an idol, you have to carry it around and it becomes this weight. The weight of maintaining my stuff. The weight of the next the, the next." you know, addictive, you know, rampage into this, what I smoke, what I shoot into my veins, what I snort up my nose, it, that'll satisfy me, that'll carry, and it doesn't, it just weighs you down more. If I just eat this food, and then I'll feel good, and it, and it doesn't, it weighs you down more, and God says, I'm here to set you free. I've come to carry you, and now you're making these gods, these idols, these false gods that you have to carry, and that weigh you down. It's exactly the opposite of what God wants for us. And this passage in, in, in Isaiah is so powerful because it paints this picture of this God that says, from, from before you can remember till when your memory fades, I will hold you. That's the God we gather to worship. Why, satis why, satisfied, why be satisfied with anything less? Everything else falls short. And, and th then in this passage, there's people that get kind of wound up because they get the part where it says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Talk about punishing children of the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me and blessing those to a thousand generations of those who love me. People go, you know, I know, I know there's people who've actually said, I left the Christian faith when I read this part of the Bible. It bothered people so much. But they don't understand what it's saying. They don't understand what it's saying. First of all, when it says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This is not a petty, immature, angry jealousy. This is the jealousy of one who loves with passion. The best way I can imagine this in my own mind is to look and say, I love my wife, Sherry. I, I've loved, we, we're just, we're, we're, this month we're celebrating our 35th anniversary and I love her more than I've ever loved her before. And I'm so thankful to God that we have this relationship. And, and, and if somebody said, well, but would you have a problem if Sherry wanted to date some other guys or have another guy in her life? Would that be a problem for you? I'd, I'd say, okay, when it comes to that, I'm a little jealous. <laughs> yeah, I'd have a problem with that. And I should, shouldn't I? I'm not going to share my wife with another man. And what God is saying is, he says, I am a jealous God. He says, I love you so much. I love you so much. I will not share you with any false gods. Because they will use and abuse you and throw you down. And I will lift you up and carry you. Our God is a jealous God. He watches over us with a, with a love that's so passionate, we don't even understand how much he loves us. Enough to send his only son. That's a lot of love. But, but then, it, he doesn't say I'm a jealous God. But the next part also throws people off. Because they look and they say, well, well, so what it says here now is that children and grandchildren can count, pay the price of their parents' evil hearts. So God is going to punish children and grandchildren because of what their parents did. And God's going to bless children and grandchildren because of what their parents did to a thousand generations. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying in a, in a family system where the parents hate God and then the children hate God and the grandchildren hate God, the point in the, in the language there is that, that each next generation still hates God. He says judgment comes because you create this culture of hate in your home. But it's only three or four generations. 
Says, but, but if you create a culture of loving God in your home, and the next person loves God and loves God, they'll be blessed. Not because the parents love, because they love God. But, what is it, but how many generations will God press out that blessing to? A thousand generations. This is a contrast. For families and, and people that teach hatred of God to the next generation, if that generation hates God, they'll, they'll deal with the consequences of that. Not because of their parents, because of their choice. But hatred can only go a few generations. But when you love God passionately and teach to the next generation, it flows to a thousand generations. That's the contrast that's being made. It's the thousand generations we should focus on. But is the saying that God will let one generation pay for the sins of the next? Absolutely not. And in Ezekiel chapter 18, this wonderful passage, verses 19 to 20, is dealing with this exact question, this exact issue. It says, you ask, why does the son not share the guilt of his father? Should the son share the guilt of the father? Why do they not? Since the son has done what is just and right, has been careful to keep all my decrees, he will surely live. If the next generation follows God, they'll live, they'll be blessed. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. You don't bear someone else's sins or wrongs, not the previous generation, not the one that follows. But we can influence generations. And if we influence the next generation to hate God, they'll, they'll live with the consequences of that. And if we influence the next generation to love God, they will celebrate the blessings of that. And so we have to understand the importance of generational faith, the power of generational faith, and the danger of not passing on faith. Too many Christians today will say things like this. It's not my job to tell my kids what to believe. I'm not gonna force my faith on my children or my grandchildren. Well, force is a strong word. But you should model it. And you should live it. And you should lift up the goodness of God. And the picture here is how one generation does impact the next. And so if you, if you, if you and your generation love Jesus and seek him and follow him and lift him up, there's gonna be, a, I think, a better chance the next generation will love him as well. Does, does, does it, are you guaranteed if you live the right way, your kids will follow? No. And also, I grew up in a home with no faith. A whole extended family, over 100 people, one Christian. And that was my dad's mom. But not my dad, not my mom, and God captured my heart at 16 years old, and I felt a call to follow Jesus and be a pastor at 16, and my family was baffled. Five kids in my family, all are Christians now, and three of us are in ministry. So God can change a generation, amen? amen? And one generation doesn't answer for the next, but one generation can and should influence the next. Do your children and grandchildren know how you love the word of God? Do they see you walking, following? Do they know the freedom and the joy that it is to walk with Jesus? They should look and say, in this crazy world, I've got examples of people who live the way that a Christian is supposed to live. My dad, my mom, my grandpa, my grandma, my aunts, my uncles, my Sunday school teacher. It's important that we impact the next generation. We can't force them, but we can lift up Jesus. And, and, and then I, I wanna just say that, that capturing the, the passion for being with God's people. So we have a thing now with the next generation where it seems to me that almost anything can be more important than worshiping with God's people and following Jesus. If, if God's first and so, well, but can this take, what can take that place in a family system? And th these days, almost anything. You know, being part of God's family, being in the church, growing in faith can take a second excuse me, second, third, fourth, fifth place very quickly. And we have to make decisions that are gonna say, I'm making, doing the best I can to hand faith to the next generation and to show them the goodness of Jesus. I'm making that a priority and I'm pouring time into that. We can pour time into so many things that don't have eternal impact. So I wanna challenge you parents and grandparents to think about that and ask how you can impact the next generation. How can we embrace and follow this command? So how do we live in this command? This, this, this command to turn away from idols and, and to move towards God. Because the real point is not just to turn down idols, but it's to put God first and to worship him and to glorify him above all. So how do we do this? Here's one idea. Cast out idols from your life. Cast out the idols. Anything that's taken that first place, anything that's bumping up, if God's first, but this thing keeps bumping up and trying to take over again, man, drive it down, cast it down. Well, how do I do that? I don't know, because I don't know what idol you're dealing with. I know the ones that come after me. I know the ones that things that try to become most important in my life. You know, for me, sometimes what it is, it's my job. You say, well, you're a pastor. That's all Jesus stuff. Yeah, but my job can actually, I have to be careful that even serving Jesus become an idol to loving and following Jesus. And every time I say, God, what's an idol in my life? He always puts something, usually he says, you know what it is. I've been telling you for a long time. I'm like, I know. 
It's like, can I deal with a different idol? No, that's the one. Like, okay, Lord. How do I cast it, Lord? What do I got to do? What do I turn to? I, and, I, and I say, I push that down and I lift Jesus up and I increase my worship and I decrease my focus and time and energy on whatever it is. And, and in some cases, for some people, that means getting help, getting counseling, getting medical help. If it's addictions, if it's struggle, you need, sometimes you go, I, can't, I need accountability, I need help. You get what it takes to cast that down and then encourage others to cast down their idols. People you love and care about, when you see something taking over their life, you can't do it for them, but you can challenge them. Cast that down. Deal with it. Turn away from that. That's becoming more important than God, and that doesn't lead to the freedom and joy that God wants for you. Make worship God-centered and not me-centered. When you gather with God's people for worship, you make sure that you are God-centered. And this is important. When we gather for worship, it's not primarily what do I get. If, if, if when you gather for worship with God's people, if the main concern is what do I get, let me ask you, who's on the throne and who's the idol at that moment? I am. Worship is not about me. It's about the glory of God. Amen? It's about lifting him up. So say, God, when I gather with your people, I'm here to glorify you. That's why after I finish preaching in about two and a half minutes, we're gonna sing one more song, about three and a half minutes, and I'm gonna ask you to give your whole heart to glorifying God at that moment. But I don't like to sing. It's not about you. I don't have a good voice. It's not about you. I don't like that style of music we use at Shirley sometimes. It's not about you. It's about God's glory. So you're gonna get three and a half minutes to live this out, a little exercise, field trip right here, practice in about two minutes, all right? Don't forget that, because I'll share a couple more thoughts. You go, I forgot about it. Don't forget that. Make worship God-centered and not you-centered. In the same way that worship can't be about me, it also can't be about you. So here's the bottom line at Shoreline. I am not primarily concerned that you have a good time when you come to worship. It's not about you. That way it would be idolatry. You're on the throne. I'm concerned we gather to worship that God is glorified. Amen? That's why we're here, to become more like Jesus, to surrender to him, to lift him up. So worship's not about me. It's not about you. Worship is about God. And anything else is idolatry. So check your heart and check your attitude. Am I doing this for other people or am I doing it for God's glory? Pursue Jesus, and see his, uh, pursue Jesus and see God in his revelation. As you see Jesus, encounter God. Walk with Jesus. See him. Worship him. Bow down to him alone. And then grow more and more passionate and engaged as you worship with God's people. Make a commitment. You want to lift God up? You want, you want to cast idols down? You spend more time lifting God up. And when we gather together, I want to challenge you from this moment on for the rest of your life. If you're visiting from out of town, you're here for the U.S. Open, or you're here for some other reason, and you're going to be back at your church next week, wherever you go, when you gather with God's people for worship, what a privilege. There's places in the world that can't do this. They are not free to do this. We can. So when we worship, man, lift up your heart. When we pray, pray with all your strength. When we open the word, let God speak to you. When we sing, sing to him. Oh God, we pray that we would become more passionate about worshiping you. We would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and know that you'll add the rest to us. And oh God, there's so many good gifts that you give that are fine and good, but Lord, when they become more important than you, they become idolatrous. So speak to our hearts, every one of us, Show us at least one area that we are letting creep up to become too important or maybe that has become the primary focal point in our lives. And Lord, let us do all it takes to cast it down and to lift you up.